Thank you, Rebecca. You know what just um, left me sitting among other things is when, you know, this, is, this has been, like you said, generations long. Like our matriarch Suzanne Harjo speaks of, it's that never give up hopeless, seeming times, day after day, year after year, century after century. And when you talk about this, um, when you talk about the land and the people, could you bring us back, because you talk about this backward and forward. Like how is it that something that began in such a, what seems to be uh, for many people in the US a distant past, but for those of us who live in native time, it just cycles over and over again. Yeah. How is it that you know, this, this past was living in the present for you that sparked you, you know, I think that is what made you able to see this story the way it did, because you're not just looking in the lens of the now, you're looking at this deep time as well that resides in you. Yeah, I mean, I think the reaction I had to the Supreme Court decision, I think it's something that a lot of citizens of the five tribes felt. And so I first found out about the case from a Muskogee legal scholar named Sarah Deer. Her work is great, you guys should check it out. Um, and she just posted about it on Facebook when the case was at the 10th Circuit, which is like one step below the Supreme Court. And I knew whatever the courts held for Muscogee Nation would most likely and ultimately it did apply to my tribe. And what I felt was just this visceral sense of justice. You know, my ancestors, you know, had signed that controversial treaty, had died for it and then the lands that they had died for and the other Cherokees had also sacrificed so much for was no longer recognized as Cherokee land. You know, our reservation boundaries within Oklahoma were no longer recognized. And what I felt was the possibility for the first time in a century that it could be, that it would be. Like, and it almost felt, it was interesting talking to tribal citizens before the decision, because I think a lot of people, like, I felt like too good to be true, you know, like in Oklahoma, I think tribes are just like, there's so much punching down that happens from the state, you know, that you're sort of like, oh, the court will never rule with us, even though it's like the law is on our side. Um, but I think that that, you know, kind of what I said in the writing is like that it was, when the decision actually came down, it was this very emotional day. But I think that because people had felt, I think as tribal citizens, we're so used to that loss and we're so used to things not going our way, um, that people felt all of that at the same time that they felt the victory, you know, at the same time that we felt this one act of justice. And so for me, that history was why um, the case mattered. And I think that's why I really wanted to write the book the way that I do. So the book sort of is like one chapter really about the case and then it goes back one chapter in history and it kind of like flip flops. And it talks about both the history of removal but then also how Oklahoma was created on top of our treaty territories through this process called allotment, which I feel like we don't talk about enough. Um, and it was extremely violent and uh yeah and so um i think you know like during oral arguments or sometimes in the briefs you would hear oklahoma or their advocate kind of paper over the history of like okay well you know what happened to the tribes was bad but that's not you know a reason to affirm the reservation now and i think i really wanted to put the you know works like words like bad were doing a lot of work <laughs> i wanted to put context that context into the case of what that history was so that we understand why these rights, why these land rights matter today. Right, so you know, when we're talking about the case, you're talking about two different, um, well, they're, they're interrelated cases. So yeah. tell us about Patrick Murphy. Who is Patrick Murphy? Yeah, so Patrick Murphy is a Muskogee citizen who um, has spent 20 years on death row and now is in federal prison, but in August of 1999, so almost exactly 25 years ago now, he murdered a fellow uh, Muscogee citizen, a man named George Jacobs. Um, it happened in a rural part of Oklahoma on the side of a dirt road. Um, and Oklahoma, when they were kind of doing their initial investigation and writing up the police report, they actually got the location wrong. Um, and if you guys are interested, I'll, I'll, I'll like take a little storytelling digression because like when I found this out, I was like, oh, this is such an interesting story. 
So um, Patrick Murphy is goes is convicted. He goes to death row, and then he gets uh, a federal public defender, and they are kind of the last line of defense before um, someone is executed. They're kind of like your last chance. Um, and this federal public defender is just basically reinvestigating the whole case, and so she's interviewing a police officer who found the murder weapon, um, and. She, he gets kind of curious and he's like, oh, where are you going? And she shows him like on the map where they're about to go. And he's like, that's the wrong place. That's not where the murder scene is. Um, Cause he had gone out there right after the murder had happened. And so they drive down this like rural dirt road in Oklahoma and they find a cross, a memorial that the Jacobs family had put out that's at the place where the police officer said it would be. And then they start thinking about jurisdiction. Because, you know, we're here in Tacoma Park, so like somebody from uh, Philadelphia couldn't come down here and prosecute you for a crime in Tacoma Park. So prosecutors and states only have jurisdiction over certain areas. And so they thought, oh, well, maybe there's something about the location that means that Oklahoma doesn't have jurisdiction. And so they hunted down all these things that have to do with like restricted land and these like little checkerboards of tribal jurisdiction. But then when they were doing that, they started looking into the reservation. They were like, actually like the reservation still exists. There's still a reservation here. And so it's this really interesting kind of twists and turns of events where, um, you know, it's, it's, I think odd for some people that this really important case for tribal sovereignty and for land rights came from a murder, but the tribes occupy this really precarious legal status under U.S. law that makes it harder, it, it makes it harder for Muskogee Nation to have just brought that suit on their own behalf. And so a lot of really important cases in sort of the canon of federal Indian law actually come from you crimes are sort of these places that you wouldn't expect. And so that's definitely true about this case. Um, and I, I just wanted that story to be well documented. You know, I feel like it's such an important part of history, how it came to be and all those weird little details. Um, I wanted that story to be recorded. So, you know, these are these are very complex matters. I mean, whether you've heard of, you know, even uh, tribes having citizenship or being, um, you know, tribes aren't just ethnic groups, not a race necessarily. It's really, this is a whole entangled, it's, it's a whole entangled, very complicated set of specific laws, sovereignties, jurisdictions, lives, uh, the lack of understanding, even for us to, you know, for people, as you said. I just wanted to bring this up and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, but, you know, I've always been, I, I, I've thought a lot over the past uh, 10 years especially about how we all hear about Trail of Tears as if it's a singular, tragic anomaly. And in fact, it's, it was a, a distinct policy, um, one that had happened over and over again prior in the colonial era. It didn't only happen to Cherokee people, it happened to Muscogee, to dozens of other tribes and nations, including um, internally prior to it being the Indian Removal Act, the, the act of removing people had happened you know, part and parcel of what is foundational uh, in what became the United States. So that, that understanding that, that all of these processes that go into this case, they're not just singular, strange events that are sad and terrible. They're really structural. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the uh, so the book talks about the history of removal of the Cherokees, the Muscogees, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, and the Seminoles. Um, and for folks who don't know, I think we think of it as this sort of, like you said, sort of just like this single act or this single tragedy, but it was really the culmination of a decade or more of U.S. policy that was really concerted. Um, Southern states had basically decided, okay, we need to make indigenous nations move so we can get this valuable land. 
And if they won't agree to move, what we'll do is we'll terrorize them on their own land until they have no choice. And we'll just make living here and staying here unbearable. Um, and then the Indian Removal Act passed. One of the things I found really interesting in the research is that I think we think that, oh, the US was just really horrible and um, you know the people of that time were just really horrible towards indigenous people. But there was actually a huge resistance movement against the Indian Removal Act. So Northern white Christians organized the largest petition drive in US history up to that point. Women, white women, organized the first public political action that women had participated in in the United States. Um, and it barely, it almost didn't pass. Um, it was very, very, very close. Um, and so I think we think of it as inevitable, as sort of something that must have happened, but it actually at the time uh, was very controversial. Um, and so the policy became, I think, Okay, I didn't turn my mic off. <laughs> I clicked something. Um, yeah, so the policy was basically for all indigenous people living within what was then the United States to be moved west of the Mississippi. Um, for Cherokees, uh, that happened after my ancestors signed the Trail of Tears or signed the Treaty of New Echota. Um, the majority of Cherokee people thought that the treaty was being renegotiated and that they would be able to stay. Um, they literally like planted fields of corn thinking that they would be there when it was came harvest time in the fall. And what happened um, at the end of May is that 7,000 soldiers and militiamen went out into the hills and the valleys of Cherokee Nation and rounded up 15,000 people at gunpoint and um, people were herded into open air stockades that the army had made out of logs. There were 25, and then once people were there, they were herded into larger concentration camps um, where there was no place to go to the bathroom, there was no sanitation, the army didn't have enough food for people, and in just four months, um, two, an estimated 2,000 people died, which was about an eighth of the entire population. Um, and then during removal, um, death followed, um, and people estimate, the, the exact number isn't known, but people estimate about a quarter of the population died. Um, there's a contemporary Cherokee scholar named Russell Thornton where he's done a lot of demographic data where he thinks that including the children that were never born, the actual population loss is closer to 10,000. Um, because of the sharp decline in birth rates and also all the people who died. And so it's just sort of a loss of life and devastation of life that I think is hard for us to fathom. And one of the big arguments that the book makes is sort of, we, you know, we still debate in this country, and it's it obnoxiously alive, this debate among academics and historians. Sometimes I tell people this and they're like, no, the U.S. is going to genocide, that's obvious. Like everyone agrees, right? And I'm like, they don't. <laughs> but historians really still debate whether or not what happened to indigenous people should be qualified or classified as genocide. Um, and it's something that as a country, you know, we've never, we've never taken responsibility for. And I think that um, one of the arguments I make in the book is that I think it informs our government to this day. You know, whether it's how we treat migrants at the border, how we um, fight wars, how we treat victims of our wars, um, you know, when we want to ban Muslims from entering our country. Oftentimes our government leans on these powers that it gave itself to dispossess indigenous peoples of their land to um, inform how it treats people at the margins of U.S. empire. Um, there's a really great legal scholar named Maggie Blackhawk who wrote an amazing Harvard Law Review article about this called the um, Constitutionalism of Colonialism. I highly recommend people checking out. But, you know, I think that we think that we can have committed these crimes and then not reformed ourselves at all and think that it wouldn't happen again. And so one of the arguments I make in the book is that this is a history that we still have a lot of work to do to recognize. Yeah, thank you. So, just want to open it uh, to the floor.